Copyright, University of South Australia. This recording may contain third-party copyright material. Apart from any use permitted under the Copyright Act 1968, no part of this recording may be reproduced or rebroadcast by any means or process without the prior written permission of the University of South Australia and the copyright owners. Welcome back to part three on the vertebral column. So now we're talking about our lumbar vertebrae. So our lumbar vertebrae, there are five of these lumbar vertebrae, and they're the largest is in the presacral group. All right, so of the things that we've talked about in the other videos, and we have a look at some of the features of our lumbar vertebrae, we can see that they are primarily uh, typical in their nature, if you think about it. So they've got a body, they have pedicles, they have a vertebral foramen, they have transverse processes, spinous processes, lamina, and articular facets. So let's have a look at how they differ from the rest of them. So the differences with your lumbar vertebrae is they are, they are all fairly similar, all right? Our atypical ones, which we have talked about in the other segments, are those L1 and L5. And that's because, as we talked about before, we have a change from the thoracic to the sacral at either end, obviously. And so we need to have some uh, differences in order to ac accommodate that, that change, all right? Now, some of the key features which will he help you then identify uh, lumbar vertebrae from other regions is that the body is bean shape. So bean shaped or kidney shaped body. The vertebral foramen is somewhat triangular. So large triangular vertebral foramen. Then it's got very large transverse processes, as we can see on this bone here. And that's for attachment of big muscles. And the spinous process, you can see is like we had in the, in the thoracic vertebrae, where the spinous process pointed downwards. Here, we can see the spinous process is directed horizontally and is shaped a bit more like a paddle. So paddle, shaped horizontal spinous process. All right, so they're gonna be our key features around the lumbar vertebrae. So let's have a go at labeling those. Once again, drawing along if you, if you feel like it. So we need our body. It needs to be large and bean-shaped or kidney-shaped. Then here we would have the pedicles and the vertebral foramen obviously extending from that. Transverse processes pointing out to the side, large ones. Then here we have the superior articular facets. Now, if you notice that their orientation is now this way, so they are orientated in the sagittal plane, whereas in the thoracic they were orientated in the coronal plane. Here then we have the articular um, processes, all right, and these articular processes here uh, for attachment to some other muscles as well, all right, and some ligaments. Then the inferior articular facets would be down below here, and the spinous process would obviously direct more towards the back, and like we said, is more paddle shaped. So coloring in like the rest of the structures that we've done, so here, this large region here, we would on the body, that would be for that secondary or uh, fibrocartilaginous joint. Now, if we remember what goes there, we talked about the fact that that's going to be where an intervertebral disc lies. Now, the intervertebral discs in our lumbar region are most at risk because of the forces that are travelling through this part of the, of the vertebral column. So, most amount of force is carried through there. So, any time when you have lots of flexion, all right, so if we put these two bones together like this, extension of these two vertebrae would be back like that, and flexion of these vertebrae would be forward like this. So... What happens when the disc uh, prolapses or um, you have a herniation of the disc is not, this is the normal amount of disc height. So the disc would occupy the space in between these two bones here. So as you can see, when you flex, 
the vertebrae pinch on the anterior aspect and that would push the intervertebral disc backwards, right? Which then would force all of the contents out the back. And here, this space is called the intervertebral foramen, where the nerves emerge. Now we've talked about nerves before, L1, L2, L3, L4, etc. So your lumbar nerves would emerge in this space here, the intervertebral foramen. And if the disc is to push backwards, it can then compress those nerves. And this can give you pain and some other problems down the leg a little bit later. All right? So then, the other articular parts that we have are these ones here, all right, and that's those zygopophyseal or Z joints that we talked about, those articular facets, all right, and the rest of the bone is just all bony structure that we would obviously then have, okay? So the lumbar vertebrae, we said they are the largest of the vertebrae, all right, and these ones are most responsible for carrying weight or bringing weight and dispersing weight from your lower limbs up to your um, thoracic region and your body, all right? So they're at the greatest risk because they are taking the most amount of force most often. All right, so let's have a go at labeling this. So vertebral body. Pedicle. Transverse process. Superior articular facet. Lamina. Spinous process. And then vertebral foramen. Alright, so your lumbar vertebrae, because their articular facets um, are orientated in the sagittal plane, the movements that we then have here are going to be flexion and extension only. We can have a small amount of rotation occur between these vertebrae, but it's only about 12 degrees total. So in this region, if you then uh, go to the video which talks about the spinal muscles, we'll learn about how that these muscles create action around these vertebrae and um, the, the movements are also more described in that part there. All right, well, thanks very much for listening to the osteology of the vertebral column and we'll catch you again soon.